Welcome back, Sleepy One, to another episode of Video Game World Tours, a series where I shine a spotlight on weird little areas you might have missed in games you love. Today's trip takes us to the land of Hyrule. No, not that one. We've already been there. Hmm. Haven't been there, but probably someday. Ah, there we go. Breath of the Wild's Hyrule. Breath of the Wild's opening sequence is one of my favorite intros to a video game. You wake up and find yourself in a small room. A thick fog is present. Dim, blue light faintly illuminates your surroundings. Most peculiar is the aesthetic of this room. Look at the wavy lines. They're so mesmerizing, you can't help but follow them with your eyes. That motif takes heavy inspiration from the Jimon period of Japan. Jimon roughly translates to cord marked, and refers to how they made pottery with pressed cords back then. The similarity between some of the pottery from that period and this design is quite noticeable. You see the style a lot throughout the game, but in this instance, as the first thing you see in the game, it's memorable. After that, you step outside and wow. Just this shot, right here, I love it. I love the implicit promise of you being allowed to go anywhere you can see. You have awoken from a deep slumber and have a vast world to explore. But not quite yet. Right now you're locked to the Great Plateau, and we have a few places to visit here first. Here's a super memorable spot to me. I remember walking out of the Shrine of Resurrection on my first playthrough, ready to begin my adventure. Almost immediately, I find this peculiar boulder poking out of the water, with a sword and a stone. It's obviously not terribly important in the scope of the world, but it's reminiscent of how the Master Sword almost always sits on a pedestal. I don't think I thought it was THE Master Sword back then, but it's a fun bit of imagery. That similarity gives this scene an aura of importance. But once you go to pick it up, you realize it's just a plain old rusty broadsword. That's cute. Nearby is our first look at some of the game's rundown buildings. A great calamity happened a hundred years ago, and a lot of the destroyed structures were just left alone. Pathways unmaintained, grass growing all over, buildings crumbling. It's sad walking around, seeing what you can only assume were such important places left deserted. This whole area is dedicated to the Temple of Time. The surrounding buildings are in such disarray, and the temple itself isn't much better. Think back to the Temple of Time from Ocarina of Time. It had such a pristine interior. It was so regal and majestic. And look at this Temple of Time. Presumably, it was nice like the one from Ocarina of Time at some point, but now it's dilapidated. You can almost imagine what it was supposed to be like back then. Footsteps echoing through the enclosed room, large windows letting in sun from the east, and a lovely stone or maybe even marble floor. But this is beautiful in its own way, with nature taking over and all. One more spot to look at before we leave the plateau. The Old Man's Cabin. It's such a humble little building. We'll see some more buildings like this later, I'll just say I love this in comparison to the Temple of Time. Where that felt so lonely and hopeless, this feels quaint. This is a place someone could live out the rest of their days in peace. It has all you need to survive out here. Food, tools, a nice comfy bed, what more could you ask for? I like the vibes here at night. I feel at one with nature. Alright, enough of our little isolated playground. Let's glide down and fully explore Hyrule. Gliding out, away from the plateau, it's almost daunting. You are given a little bit of guidance and told to go to Kakariko, but it's so easy to ignore that. There's landmarks every which way, and even where there aren't landmarks, it's tempting to just walk down there and look for a nice view. I adore Hyrule Field. 
It's so expansive and inviting. It calls back to Ocarina of Time's Hyrule Field. Though that felt very video gamey, almost truncated in a way. Locations felt too close together in OOT. But here, the scale makes the world believable. It will take you a good chunk of time to walk to Hyrule Castle from the Great Plateau. You'd probably die before you got there, but that's besides the point. The emptiness is what sells it. There's not a huge city throughout here, or even a dozen houses dotted around to break up the landscape. Nintendo gives the world space to breathe. It takes restraint and talent as a designer to know when to let nature speak for itself. My favorite spot in Hyrule Field is at the top of Whistling Hill. You get a great view at the barren field before you. This area isn't totally empty though. The obvious landmark on the horizon is Hyrule Castle. This is where you start to get a true feel for what civilization was like back then. Walking through the front gates, the remains of Hyrule Castle Town reveals itself. There's this network of paths that wind all around, with ruined buildings at every point. It's one thing to see a single ruined building, but seeing a whole town just decimated hits different. There was a whole society going on here. Homes, stores, restaurants, all reduced to rubble. And what's more, it's not just destroyed, it's consumed by malice. This icky paint-like goop. And yes, it's moving. Hyrule Castle looms over the sad town. It stands out as the biggest man-made building in the game. Despite that, there's only a few locations that stick out to me. Number one is the throne room. This is where you fight Calamity Ganon. This is a beautifully designed room. It just oozes royalty with the red carpet, stone carvings, and the thrones themselves. I can just tell this was so pretty back in the day. Unfortunately, you don't even get to explore this room. The picosecond you cross the threshold and enter, a cutscene plays and the fight begins. Once you finish, the game is over, and you start from your last save, before the fight. This isn't even one of those video game rooms you only get to visit once and never return. You don't get to enter it at all. A normal player is not allowed to soak in this environment. But we're not normal players, so I hope you enjoy this little look at it. Location number two is technically two locations. Zelda's bedroom and research room. They're really close, so I kind of see them as one. Looking around these rooms doesn't reveal anything surprising. A lot of books, what was once a nice bed, and as you might expect to find in a teenager's bedroom, her diary. She talks about Link a lot. She acknowledges that Link doesn't talk, how he's always nearby to protect her, but not a word passes his lips. Oh my god, he talks? I mean, we obviously don't see that, but Link canonically speaks words? That's a crazy revelation I wasn't expecting to find. I mean, I guess you have dialogue choices where Link responds to NPCs. I don't know. It's just weird to imagine Link actually talking about how much he loves to eat. It's easy to sympathize with Zelda. She has this immense pressure to live up to her role in an ancient prophecy warning of Calamity Ganon's return. And you can see the toll that pressure takes on her in her rooms. She talks about it in her diary. She has piles of books and a fair amount of papers hung up on the walls. You can almost feel her desperation in the state of her rooms. She knows the deadline for the prophecy is coming, and she's feeling the heat. A beautiful bit of environmental design. Heading back to the field, there's one more area I want to cover for this section. The Ranch Ruins. Do any of you Zelda fans recognize this? Does it seem familiar? Yeah. This is Lon Lon Ranch from Ocarina of Time. Well, it's designed to look like Lon Lon Ranch, but I don't think it's actually the same one from that game. There's practically no other locations that match up quite like this between the two games. And I doubt that Ocarina of Time takes place thousands of years before Breath of the Wild, and this ranch was all that survived. To me, it's more of an emotional thing. Before this came out, we weren't familiar with Breath of the Wild's Hyrule. Nearly every Zelda game takes some creative liberties when it comes to its world. 
And this game's big thing was taking place after society collapsed. And yeah, seeing all these ruined buildings throughout the game tells you that, but it's something else to see a location you're familiar with look like this. So while it might be a coincidence in-world that this ranch happens to look like Lon Lon Ranch from Ocarina of Time, it serves as good emotional weight for the player. There's a shrine quest that has you fetching orbs from the necks of three nearby Hinox. The quest is titled The Three Big Brothers. You might think the title refers to the Hinox, but it probably actually refers to the even bigger brothers. There are three massive rib cages, all pretty close to each other. This is the only shrine quest I actually remember, because the thought of something even bigger than a Hinox wandering around is terrifying. Who knows what life was like back when these creatures roamed the lands. Sitting here, tucked against the single rib bone, puts everything into scale. Look at how tiny Link is. I had to zoom up this high to see the whole thing, and Link is barely visible anymore. Puts these so-called big brothers to shame. Along the southern coast of Hyrule lays Lurilin Village. I did portray the world as kinda dour towards the beginning of the video, but a lot of the villages in the game are pretty nice. People have established themselves in little pockets of the world, and are content with just existing. All the villagers' homes are just one little circular room. From the outside, they almost look like acorns. Something I don't think I appreciated about the game during my normal playthroughs back in the day was the interior design of buildings and houses. There's a lot of… things. I feel like most games don't place enough objects inside of homes. But the designers did a great job putting enough things in houses like this to make them feel lived in, but not cluttered to the point of absurdity. It's just right. And this view, how about that? I love a good tropical area in games, and this is a great one. These palm trees, and the ocean stretching out into the distance. I would love to take a stroll on this beach myself. In fact, if I could live in any village in the game, it'd be this one. From the sunny sands of southeastern Hyrule to the sunny sands of southwestern Hyrule, welcome to the Gerudo Desert. You know, I'm usually not too big a fan of deserts in games, but I like this one. I think the game's weather system does this region justice. This isn't just a sandy landscape with a heatwave effect. It's a hot desert where you actually have to consider the heat. You have to wear clothing that keeps Link cool when the sun beats down on him. Just like Hyrule Field, this is a barren landscape. I became quite familiar with the path from the start of the desert to Gerudo Town. But there's so much more beyond that. So much emptiness. And of course, the occasional point of interest. Like the Southern Oasis. Not only is it far away from civilization, it's completely locked away on top of this rock. The only way to get up here is by climbing. Which is not a big ask for Link, but for someone who's dying of dehydration and could really use a drink of water right now, sucks for them. Though I guess some people were up here before. There's a cooking pot as well as some larger boxes. Why did someone bring these here? And how? Regardless, this is a nice spot for such a harsh environment. While we're here, I guess we can take a quick peek at Gerudo Town. They have such a nice little thing going on here. This town feels well fleshed out. I always look for a food source in video game villages, as it's something that can be easily forgotten about by a developer or not noticed by the player. Here, in this arid wasteland, they can't grow much. There is a tiny little patch of wild berries you can play a part in growing, but these plants aren't enough to sustain the village. The majority of the food comes from trade. Spera, one of the Gerudo vendors, reveals she's married and lives outside of Gerudo Town. In fact, a lot of Gerudo women do that, but they come back into town to sell their wares from across the land. 
It's neat that there's an in-universe explanation for how these people in the desert get enough food to sustain a village of this size. The interiors are great. The architecture in here feels unique compared to what we saw in Lurlin and what we will see in future villages. Though I'm not too knowledgeable when it comes to building techniques. How would you describe this? To me, it's almost like these were shaped out of mud. I like that there's holes in the wall for decorative objects as opposed to shelves. Well, there are shelves, but there's a lot more crevices carved directly into the buildings themselves. Look at this storage area for tools in a jewelry shop. There's so many little things that are presumably useful to the jewelry crafting process. Here are some couches in the same shop. Slabs of mud were shaped into the form of a couch, and they just plopped some cushions on them. Details like that give these rooms so much more personality than if it was just a normal couch or bed like you'd see in another region. Sneaking into the chief of the Gerudo's room, we can see that she lives much in a similar way to the common people. Her room isn't totally extravagant and unlike anything we've seen so far. It's pretty grounded. She has a ton of books, which makes sense considering her social status. She probably has to do a lot of reading. Oh, and I love her little Saiyan seal plushies. She may be the ruler of the people, but Riju is still a kid. In fact, if you sneak up on her at night, you can see her do this adorable little hop while looking at one of her stuffed animals. When you approach her, you can see her asking the stuffed animal what they should play. But if you talk to her, she tries to get you to ignore them. So cute. Welcome back to Bird Check, the VGWT mini-segment where I rate a game's birds. And Breath of the Wild has a lot of them. Rather than rate every single one, I'm just going to pick my favorite and rank that. Which is... The Cucko. Hey, chickens are still birds. I think this little guy is beautiful. Cuckoos have occasionally had pretty simplistic designs throughout the Zelda games, but they leaned into a more flamboyant design here. It works well. 4 out of 5 stars. Alright, back to location spotting. Our next stop is Kakariko Village. I love the geographical location of the village. It's nestled in the northern region of Nakluda, high up in the mountains. It's especially beautiful at night. Lamps along every pathway and the occasional lit fire give Kakariko a warm, cozy feeling once the sun sets. You can see the wind gently blowing things around. Bits of grass and fog float away. I can almost feel the slight chill of the wind. The clacking of wood dangling above you is some nice ambient noise. That's one of those things you never really pay attention to, but you notice subconsciously. A late night stroll through here would be nice. Here's a little produce shop. I love that shops in this game have their inventory out for you to see. You walk through the door and you can physically see what they're selling and how much they have. Here, there's 12 carrots in this basket, and you can buy... 12 carrots! Revolutionary! Let's check out the houses. Cozy. I like the super dark wood mixed with the lighter colored walls. And this weird maze-like pattern, it's all over the buildings here. These are some nice homes. Has everything you'd need... Where's the bathroom? There's no bathroom in any of these buildings. And no outhouse in sight. Not even a porta potty. And where do they. Ugh, never mind. I don't want to think about this anymore. Kakariko is nice and all, but I still think I'd rather live in Lurlin. If you could live in any village in this game, where would you go? Let me know in the comments. Terrytown is a town you actually help build up yourself. You come across this little plateau in the northeastern corner of the map, and you slowly gather materials to build new buildings. And as those buildings are built, people move in. Eventually this cute little circle of buildings is finished. It's not as fully realized as Kakariko or Lurlin, but it's meaningful in that you helped to build this. You went to these people and convinced them to move here. The vibes in the town square are great. 
Shops are set up, people are walking around, and this beautiful fountain at the center. It all pulls it together. Houses even have little front yards. Inside the houses feel a little weird. They're kind of plain. Most of the furniture is blocky. The houses themselves are pretty blocky as well. It looks like they were assembled by putting various cubes together. It's an interesting design aesthetic, but I'm not sure how I feel about it. And some of the porches feel empty. Look at all the space back here. If this was my house, I'd put some chairs out back here to sit and enjoy the view. But the current homeowners are doing nothing with this space. I feel like a little bit of furniture back here would help out the vibes of Terrytown. Make it feel like more of a community. I thought I'd try out something special for this episode of Video Game World Tours, and do something I've never done before. Breath of the Wild is a big game, and I was bound to miss some cool spots, no matter how long this video is. So I reached out to you guys to see what your favorite areas in the game were. I made a community post on YouTube, and asked my Discord, which you should join by the way, and I got some pretty cool answers. YouTube commenter SpyCrab told me I should investigate the Out of Bounds area in the Trial of the Sword. The Trial of the Sword is a gauntlet of challenges that take place in instanced rooms. You're supposed to scavenge items and defeat the enemies locked inside with you. Once you do that, you're teleported to the next room. Repeat until you've done them all. When a player is in an enclosed area like this, it's no surprise that they'd want to see the world outside of it. Do you want to go and see what's beyond these walls? N no? Oh, well that's, that's fine I guess. We're doing it anyway. Wow, they weren't kidding. This really is a weird area. Outside of the box, it's just a relatively flat plane stretching out pretty far. There are these little patches of details sprinkled throughout, but those are the grounds for each individual challenge. Like here, notice this patch of dirt right here, and how the grass is dead around the fire pit. And look at its position relative to the teleporter. Now we enter the teleporter to go to the next challenge. Over here there's a patch of detail. There's a little bit of raw dirt and there's a hole in the ground. This seems to line up pretty well to that first room to me. Zooming out a bit puts it all into perspective. The box just slides down the path as you complete each challenge. What's weird to me is this huge valley. I don't think I did the Trial of the Sword when I played this game, so you'll have to fill me in. Is this used during the trial at all? All the other patches of land have detailing matching up to the mainland. Like, there's different layers of grass, weeds, and slightly different variations in height. But there's practically none of that in this valley. I love the skybox and ambient lighting. Standing right here at the edge, noticing this drop-off and never-ending water in the distance. It's bizarre. Almost like it's from a dream. Commenter... 187? They recommended to me the Yiga clan hideout. You come here during the main quest, and you're instructed to infiltrate the secret ninja hideout. You do a ton of sneaking around to avoid guards, but once you return, it's empty. There's no guards roaming about, so we get to explore at our own pace. It's kind of a bland area. I don't know what this would be good for in-universe. To me, this just seems like a video game level. There is this room, where I found the Donkey Kong Banana Horde. I can't believe the Yiga are in cahoots with King K. Rule. Yeah, I don't know, this place doesn't really do it for me. There's just these bland stone blocks all over the place. They're here to block sight lines to make the stealth section more fun, but these could have been crates or something. Why would the Yiga have these up? There is this cool room at the end where you fight a boss. They added this shrine in the DLC, I don't really like it. I think this room would look better as a purely empty circular room, with a spooky bottomless pit. YouTube commenter and Discord member Bo reminded me of Selmy Spot. Selmy Spot is a cozy little cabin way up north in the Hebra Mountains. It's owned by Selmy. She's a shield surfing legend, and will even let you play a shield surfing minigame. But that's not why we're here. We're here to intrude in and gawk at her house. Sorry, Selmy, I'll be quick. I love that there's a ton of houses in the game completely separated from everyone. So many people are content to live by themselves and be with nature. 
It kind of pokes at that primal urge to just say good riddance to modern society. No cell phones, no bills, no obligations. Just hanging out by yourself in the forest or mountains. Do other people feel like that? Or is it just me? Whatever, moving on. Our final viewer-suggested spot is by Cactus Man from the Discord. He implored me to check out Makar Island. Makar Island is kind of sad. So much of the game's environments feature the beauty of nature and life, but this island's main theme is death. A dead tree surrounded by a circle where grass refuses to grow, and a pile of bones around it. There's nothing of interest here. Literally nothing. A quest doesn't bring you here. There's no chest. And hell, no Korok seed. There's 900 Korok seeds all over the place, and they didn't put a single one on this strange island. It feels like it should house one, right? But there's nothing. I found this Reddit post from six years ago, noting all the little details, trying to make sense of it. There's a single rock. There's a campfire directly under the tree so the rain doesn't put it out. They think the island might be built out of skulls? You know what? As I was gliding down here, I did kind of think the foundation looked like some skulls. I had that thought before finding the Reddit thread. Then again, a similar texture is on the cliffside of the Great Hyrule Forest, so there's probably nothing to that. I love the sheer confusion of this island. It's reminiscent of secrets in older games where you have to figure out stuff yourself. Nowadays, secrets are brute forced and figured out instantly. Most of the time. But not all the time. Is there something we missed about Makar Island? Is it still hiding a secret till this very day? Who can say? Wait a minute. I think I see something. I don't think anyone has noticed this before. There's something carved into the tree. What could this mean for the mystery of Makar Island? Okay, we're going to close out this video with my favorite spot in the game. But we're not going to fast travel there. Instead, we'll do a bit of traveling in real time and talk about some stuff. This series mostly has me focusing on specific areas. Like earlier, we looked at the ruins of Lon Lon Ranch and Zelda's bedroom. Those are perfect spots for a video like this. But when I sat my gamer ass down and brainstormed areas to cover in a Breath of the Wild video game world tour, I didn't think of any one particular spot. I thought of Hyrule as a whole. I look around me, and I don't see many, quote, iconic locations. I just see hills and slopes. That's what I remember from the game. I remember looking for ledges to stand on as I scale massive mountains. I remember gliding down from towers and looking around me. I remember galloping down long roads on my trusty horse. Does that make sense? So much time is spent walking around and exploring, the raw geography of Hyrule is comforting to me. And up here, at my favorite spot in the game, you get a perfect view at all of Hyrule. It's not quite the highest point in the game, but I love its position. You can spin the camera around you 360 degrees and always have something to look at. But of course, I love gazing at Hyrule Field. The raw plains that we were walking moments earlier now seem so small. Plus, we have these two little statues up here, gazing out upon this geographic masterpiece. If you liked this video, check out my tour of Ocarina of Time. That's a two-parter, so there's a lot of Zelda goodness to see there. Join the Discord, check me out on Patreon, follow my Twitter, blah blah blah. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.